Good morning, Westminster. Welcome to the service of worship at Westminster United Methodist Church. This would normally be Casey greeting you, but she is unfortunately under the weather today, so keep her in your prayers. My name is Meredith Mills. I'm the pastor of this congregation, and I'm privileged to lead this amazing community of faith. So whether you are joining us from the Houston area or beyond, you are welcome. We're glad you're here, and we invite you to wherever you are, whether you're in your living room or your bedroom or your car, uh, get centered. Listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit, because it's holy ground. Would you join with me as we pray a word of welcome to the Holy Spirit in coming into this time of worship together? Almighty Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for your presence with us. Thank you for the gift of your Spirit drawing us together even when we are apart. Holy Spirit, come. Fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Keep us listening to you in the next few minutes that we might raise our hearts and our voices in worship. This we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, you better mind. Got to give an account at the judgment, you better mind. Oh, you better mind. Oh, you better mind. You got to give an account at the judgment, you better mind. You better mind how you talk. You better mind what you're talking about. You got to give an account at the judgment. You better mind. You better mind how you sing. You better mind what you're singing about. Cause you got to give an account at the judgment. You better mind. Oh, you better mind. Oh, you better mind. You got to to give an account at the judgment, you better mind. You better mind how you pray. You better mind what you're praying about. You got to give an account at the judgment, you better mind. You better mind how you shout. You better mind what you're shouting about, cause you got to give an account at the judgment. You better mind, oh, you better mind, oh, you better mind. You got to give an account at the judgment. You better mind, oh, you better mind. Count at the judgment, you better mind, you better mind. Good morning, boys and girls. Thank you for joining us on this wonderful Sunday morning to talk about Jesus. Today, I brought something exciting to share with you. Let's see what it is. This is it. Do you know what this is? That's right, it's a flashlight. And I'm sure you have used a flashlight before. Maybe you went on a camping trip. Maybe the lights went out at your house and you wanted to be able to see. Maybe you just used a flashlight for fun just to play with your friends. There are many reasons to use a flashlight and they're so easy to use. You simply push the button and voila. Flashlights are important because when it's dark outside, they allow you to see what's in front of you. And the Bible tells us to be like flashlights. God tells us to be the light of the world and to shine God's light in everything we do. And that way other people can know him too through us. 
And there's many ways to do this. One of the easiest ways to do this is just to be nice to other people. And then when you're nice, you can tell them it's because of Jesus. Jesus lives in me and loves me and has told me to be nice to you too. So talking about lights and being the light, I wanna sing one of my favorite songs and I know you probably know it too. It's This Little Light of Mine. So everyone hold up their light and sing with me. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Good job, guys. You always want to let your light shine. God loves you so much. And because he loves us so much, he wants us to share that love with everyone else. So with that, let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, thank you so much for loving us and help us shine our light for everyone to see. Amen. Bye guys. Welcome back everyone. It is wonderful to have you all with us virtually again. We are in the middle of a very exciting sermon series on the book of Revelation because it's 2021 and why not preach on Revelation? Um, we have been through over half of it now and so we're starting to round a bend. There's kind of one more um, tough week to get through and then we get to the good news starting next week and then it is two weeks of really, really good news. Uh, some of the most beautiful passages in the whole in the whole Bible. And so if you've missed the sermons before, I encourage you to go back and listen to them. It's a um, historical overview and also a theological overview of this, one of the most powerful books of the Bible. Um, it is not nearly as, well, maybe it is as scary as it sounds, but it's not scary in the way you think it is. Um, and it's also powerful and wonderful and beautiful. Um, I encourage you to go back and listen to those other sermons because today we're a little bit over halfway through the series and we're talking about the letter to the church at Sardis. And so this is going to be, it's going to be along the same themes of what we've talked about so far, but it's going to have a little bit of a different slant to it. This is Revelation 3 beginning with verse 1. Now, as a, as a recap, you remember Revelation opens with these letters to seven churches of seven, uh, seven, seven churches in Asia Minor. And um, each of those letters has a particular theme. And what I've been doing is I've been taking that theme and then connecting it to other themes in Revelation. So while we are primarily talking about these seven letters, we are also talking about John's message to the, the church in the rest of the book. And so we've been through um, a lot of the historical things. We've been through a lot of the symbolism. Last week, we tackled the two beasts, the dragon and the number 666. And so if you missed that, go check it out. This morning, um, we're doing the church at Sardis. And this is what John writes to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you do not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out that name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And you'll notice that all of 
The letters have ended with whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, meaning that these words are for us. May we have ears to hear what the Spirit says even to us. So this particular book, the, the historical background of this book is that Sardis was a city um, with a particular historical memory. So, you know, when you grow up in cities, you you rem you have this, this historical memory of things that happened in them. I grew up in San Antonio and I knew the word Alamo before I knew the word mommy. Not quite, but it was it was there. Well, the Alamo was just at the center of our identity. All of us could recite <laughs> that letter. I will never surrender or retreat. Um, all of us could quote Davy Crockett. In fact, I had a Davy Crockett birthday party when I was a child because it was it, it was a part of who we were as a place. Sardis was one of those places, and their cultural memory is that they were considered a completely impregnable city. They were in a very um, good location. They were surrounded by cliffs. Um, nobody had ever defeated them before, and so they got comfortable, and they'd never been defeated until one day, one time, an incredibly brave warrior managed to scale those cliffs, leading to a surprise attack that because nobody was expecting it ended up being devastating. And that's in their memory. That's in the cultural memory. So have that in the background when you hear the words of this book, when it says, wake up. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. You see, what's happening here is Jesus, through John, is talking to a church that thinks they've got it all together. It's talking to a church that is comfortable in their prosperity. It's talking to a church that is complacent. It's talking to a church that thinks they're doing great and has the numbers and the money and the comfort to prove it. You have a reputation of being alive, however you want to interpret that, and they means that they it means that they've got the bragging rights that they want. And yet you are dead. And so Jesus says to them, Wake up or I will come to you like a thief in the night. And the cultural memory that was being evoked there is that long ago warrior climbing those cliffs. You know, one warrior climbing cliffs is easy to defeat if anyone is awake and looking for him. But if they're not, then he is devastating. Wake up or I will come to you like a thief in the night. The theme that is being brought out in this book that gets repeated later on in the book is the theme of complacency in prosperity. And this gives a little bit of a different a dynamic to what we've been talking about in the other themes of the book, because the other themes of the book have been very direct. It's been about what do you do when soldiers knock on the door and ask who you worship? What do you do when the government passes a law saying that you can't, that you um, have to violate some part of your religious beliefs about how you should treat your neighbor or how you should treat the earth or how you should worship? What do you do when push comes to shove and you have to throw your allegiance behind, and, and throwing your allegiance behind the lame who was saying slaying costs you in this life? That's what we've been talking about in the rest of this book. And this book has a little, this letter has a little bit of a twist to it. And it shows us that sometimes the beast, the dragon, however we want to, um, say it sometimes the threat comes not overtly but covertly when we are not threatened we are seduced sometimes the danger comes not from soldiers at the door sometimes the danger comes from a quiet well-spoken mild-mannered person saying oh but don't you want to just join in and here's what i'm talking about I'm going to skip ahead with you to Revelation 17. This is another one of those famous passages. All of you who have ever heard about the whore of Babylon, we're about to get to the whore of Babylon. See, they should make Christmas cards out of Revelation. Wouldn't you buy a Christmas card? Never mind. Okay, um, Revelation 17. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and said, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. This is the PC translation. It's prostitute, not whore. <laughs> With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated by the wine of her adulteries. Now, you have to remember, we none of this is literal. We're not talking literal. We're not, uh, 
the image of fornication is fundamentally an Old Testament image of worshiping other gods. So if Israel was supposed to be in a monogamous marriage with Yahweh, with God, uh, and the image for that was, I am your husband, you are my wife, and then you committed adultery by worshiping other gods, that's the image that's being used here. And so when we say the whore of Babylon, it's it's referencing idolatry. It's referencing the worshiping, not just the worshiping of one other god, the worshiping of many gods, worshiping of whoever, worshiping of anyone and everyone. Verse three, then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. Does that sound familiar? If you don't get the beast reference, go back and listen to next last week had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a cup in her hand. I'm going to pause there. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. You fast forward that image a little bit, and this woman is wearing the latest fashion, riding in the nicest car. Her heels are four inches high. Her nails are perfect. Her makeup is perfect. She has everything the world says she should want. And she holds a golden cup in her hand, offering it out to you. This is almost reminiscent of in Proverbs, there are these two women, the Lady Wisdom and Lady uh, Vice, and, and the, the foolish woman offering something that looks wonderful, offering something that smells enticing, offering something that I know uh, everyone would want, and yet in her hand is a golden cup filled with abominable things. And what John is saying to you is John is painting this image. This whore of, whore of Babylon, which we're about to get to, looks wonderful. She looks beautiful. She has everything anyone would want. She is the perfect, the ideal, the everything the world says you should want, both as a man and as a woman. She has it, and she offers out something that looks wonderful, and yet... It is filled with abominable things. John gets quite colorful. Um, you can think of the most disgusting thing in the world in that cup, and you get about the image that he's trying to give you. And so this, this, this idea that's getting, pro this is a trickery, right? This is a deception. This is not soldiers coming to your door and saying, who do you worship? This is somebody who's dressed nice, who's offering you nice things. But it's not true. It's not real. It's fake. It's a lie. What they are offering is actually death. And here's what that means. As you go on, verse 5, The name written on her forehead was a great mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and abominations of the earth. Old Testament, the people of God were in the promised land, and because they royally screwed up so many times, God punished them by allowing them to be conquered and taken into exile by an empire called Babylon. And so Babylon goes down in symbolic spiritual history as the enemy of God's people, the one who holds God's people in oppression and exile, kind of like Egypt. Egypt is the symbol of the, the, the force that holds God's people in slavery. Babylon is the symbol of the force that holds God's people in exile. And so this woman has on her forehead Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. Okay, first century listeners, you're hearing this woman is a symbol of something called Babylon, and Babylon is the empire that oppresses the people of God. Once again, there's only one candidate for that, the first century churches. These are all various symbols having to do with Rome and the Roman Empire. And the difference between this chapter and the last chapter is in last chapter, the Roman Empire was a beast and the Roman Empire was threatening and the Roman Empire was going to 
rip your throat out if you didn't worship the dragon. And here, the Roman Empire is a seductress. The Roman Empire is a nice looking woman. The Roman Empire is holding out a cup of wine, asking, are you sure? Are you sure? You don't really want to drink it. Now, I'm not going to go too, I spent a whole lot of time on the Bible study last week. I'm not going to go too deep into this. If you look at the next chapter, John actually decodes these for you. He talks about the seven, uh, the beast being the hill on uh, the the city on seven hills, and he talks about the he 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 decodes it to where there's 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 no question anymore. Like this is Rome. This is <laughs> this is obviously Rome. And fundamentally, this is supposed to be kind of a partner with the image we talked about last week. Last week was Rome as the warring beast. This week is Rome as the seductive woman. And what, what, the, what the message of this chapter fundamentally comes to is that sometimes the temptation for our allegiance to Christ comes in the form of threats, and sometimes it comes in the form of seduction. And for us, I've said many times that we are not in the moment in history when you and I are fearful of soldiers coming on our door. That's not our story. But this one, sometimes the beast comes with threats and sometimes he comes with seduction. Sometimes she comes with comfort. Sometimes he comes with enticement saying, all you have to do to turn your allegiance away from the lamb Let's just drink this lovely looking cup. Do you remember when Satan took Jesus to the top of a high mountain and he showed him the kingdoms of the world and he said, all you have to do is bow down and worship me and I will give you all of this. You see, you and I in the United States of America, in this age, in an age that despite all of our troubles right now is really better than most ages in the history of the world, live in a time when the majority of our temptations will be temptations of comfort. The majority of our compromises of our allegiance will be compromises that happen quietly and slowly, will be compromises that happen little at a time, will not be a giant denunciation of Christ, but will be a little turning, and then a little turning, and then a little turning. And what Jesus says to us through John here is that is just, if not more, deadly. Wake up. Wake up. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, or I will come to you like a thief in the night. John in this chapter takes direct aim at all of those who through their complacency have forgotten the extent to which worship of the slain lamb commands control over our lives. It commands control over how we treat every human being on earth. It commands control over how we use our time, over how we use our money. It commands control over how we treat the earth, the natural resources of the earth. It commands control over everything. Our allegiance to the one seated on the throne is one that asks of us everything. And the seduction of the beast is saying, don't you want this this cup? It's just a little compromise. It's just a little compromise. It won't hurt anything. And John is pulling back this veil saying, that cup is full of blood and filth and abomination. So when I was in college, or just, yes, I was in college, sorry, time has gone away from me, and all of a sudden, I am not nearly as young as I used to be. When I was in college, I took three months, and I volunteered in a small village in rural Nicaragua. It was in the undeveloped part of the undeveloped part of the country, and so it was, um, it was rural. Uh, people lived in elevated houses with, with thatch on the roof. We were one of the only homes that had electricity in the village. Um, I spent three months there, and it was wonderful. It was one of the most transformative experiences of my life. The people were wonderful. The experience was wonderful. Um, I, I got to a, a whole other level of my faith there. I, I still remember that as one of the turning points of my life. One aspect of it, and this is what I want to share with you. 
when I went there and I spent my first few days actually in the village, completely cut off from my normal world of electricity and cars and first world comforts, I felt like I was on another planet because I'd seen pictures before, but I'd never actually lived outside what I would now call the first world comfortable bubble before. And getting outside that was so uncomfortable for me because I had, I had just never experienced it. But as we went on, I spent three months there. Again, that's not that long, but it was long enough to just switch the course of my life as the more time I spent there the more I really began began to come to terms with what I actually need versus what I actually want because I had a whole lot less down there and you know what I was happier and so I had a whole lot less and I could see that me being an American being a North American what my money could do in a place like this and so I th th in those three months I developed this plan that when I got back to the United States I could continue to live at this very, very um, subsistence level because I was happy because that's all I needed. I could save my money and then I could really do some good with my money by sending it back to individuals and schools and things like that because I had those contacts because I knew what that money could do. One dollar would buy nothing in the United States. One dollar would buy so much down there. And I thought, this is how I can make a difference. And I came back and I remember I... I pared down my closet to about two pairs of pants and four shirts. I remember I um, uh, <laughs> I saved all of my money. I remember that I was I was translating everything from dollars into soles, which was the the uh, monetary donation, the, the monetary denomination down there. And I remember this one moment when I was in a shop. Um, I. I didn't go shopping because I didn't, I didn't need anything, but I was in a shop and I looked and I saw this pair of earrings that I wanted and they were $12. And I remember thinking, how many school supplies would $12 buy in Nicaragua? And I turned around and I walked out. Fast forward, same me, same person, about two years later, and I didn't think twice about spending 50 or $60 on a pair of earrings. Much less if you wanna look at the rest of my wardrobe, if you wanna look at my lifestyle, if you wanna look at all those other things. What had changed? What had changed? The outward reality of the world had not changed. What had changed was that I had become comfortable again in this world. Little tiny choices, little tiny things about my lifestyle. I had become comfortable again in this world and I had forgotten that there that this world is actually not how most of the world lives. I'd forgotten that my experience in Nicaragua was actually probably more normative for the world than my experience of life here. Now I say that not as a we should all sell everything and go live in the streets and be poor. That's not the point of that example. The point of the example is this. My allegiance to the lamb my allegiance to the lamb is shown in how I think about what I buy and how I think about how I spend my time and how I think about how I treat every human being and how I think about how I treat the earth and how I think about all of these. That is what my allegiance to the lamb looks like. That is what my worship looks like. My worship is partly me showing up and worshiping and declaring allegiance to the Lamb on Sunday morning when we raise our voices in worship, at least pre-pandemic, raise our voices in worship together. That is part of my worship. But my worship spills out of there into every aspect of my life, it makes me a person as a whole person whose entire lifestyle points toward a kingdom that is coming instead of the broken creation that is here. And my allegiance to the lamb means all of those small choices of my life add up to being a person whose entire being points to a coming new creation, one by the blood of the lamb, in which God's justice, God's peace, and God's reign affects and rules everything. And my worship is all of that so that my choices to not think about God 
and what I buy and what I do and how I spend my time and my choices to not think about God and all of that are a form of idolatry. That is a form of me looking at that cup, that tempting cup, and saying, that looks pretty good. And John is pulling back the curtain saying, you don't understand, that is full of death. Now you understand what I'm saying. I am not, I'm not, this is not a our poverty sermon. This is not, especially in this age of people being shamed and guilted about not doing it. This is not the voice that's trying to shame you or guilt you about what you're not doing. This is the voice. This is the sermon that says, if you are not thinking spiritually about all your life choices, you got to wake up because you don't have forever to start thinking the way God wants you to think. We need to wake up because our allegiance as people of the land in this age, in this era, in this time will be shown not just by what we say, not just by our verbal allegiance to Christ, but by our lifestyle, by our choices, by our time, by our talents, by our gifts, by our service, by our witness. That is how we show. That is how we worship. That is how we stand and refuse the beast in whatever form the beast may present himself. Which is why Westminster, and I mentioned this last week, but I really want to talk about it this week. Westminster is in 2021 having what we're calling a year of service. And here's what it means. We are going to basically have a stewardship drive for service. We are going to basically um, ask you to commit part of your time to the work of God, both in the church and in the community. And you get to decide how you do it. And there are distance options and there are in-person options. So if you are worshiping with us from Alaska, there are still things you can participate in. You get to choose how to do it. But what we are doing is we are sending out an email tomorrow. We're sending out a letter tomorrow. There are, um, the, everything's on the church website right now. If you want to go check it out, wumc.com. You'll, uh, but you'll get a letter, you'll get an email tomorrow. And we want everyone who calls Westminster home to prayerfully commit to service in the church and service outside of the church. Now that can be simple. It doesn't need to take a ton of time. I know people don't have a ton of time. It can be as simple as opening a door on a Sunday morning that could check your box for service inside of the church, or it could be as more in depth than that. Your service in the community could be as simple as writing a letter to somebody who is in prison, donating blood, um, dropping something off at a food pantry, whatever you want to do. We're going to ask Westminster to commit the same way we do for stewardship, because we think your time is at least as important as your money. We're going to ask Westminster to commit a portion of their time in 2021 to service because, because that's how we show where our true allegiance lies. If you want to prove, if we want to prove, if we want to show that we are not worshiping the beast in whatever form the beast may present itself, we give all of our lives back to God. We use our time and our talents and our gifts and our service to point to a future that is coming, to point to a creation that is coming, to point to goodness, to plant trees while the world is on fire because we believe God is still king, because we believe the creation is coming, because we believe that there will come a day when every tear is wiped away and every wound is bound up, when the new heavens and the new earth and the new creation come to fruition. And that is almost next week. We're going to get to that next week. We're going to get to that. In the meantime, you've got two weeks and your homework is to pray and to think. I want you to think about your time. I want you to think about your talents. I want you to think about your blessings and what you have been given. And I want you to prayerfully consider how God wants you to give back of your time this year. And in two weeks on February 14th, we're going to ask you to commit yourself by turning in a card virtually or by turning in a card in person to give your time and your talents to the building of the kingdom, the coming of the new creation, and the spreading of light 
in a world that desperately needs light right now. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Almighty Heavenly Father, God, we are so grateful for everything that you have given us, and we confess to you that we have not appreciated what we have been given. We confess that there are so many ways in which we have slipped into underappreciating. We have slipped into complacency. We have slipped into sleep. And so God, wake us up. Wake us up. Show us what we have. Show us what we can do. Show us how to prove our allegiance to you here and now in this age, in this world. Show us how to bring some of your light into the world. Come, Holy Spirit, we are yours. This we say as we pray together the prayer our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Folks, this is the point in our service where we start to give back. And we give you time every week to think about it because every week God has given you more and every week he asks you to give it back. And we talk about that with money and we talk about that with time. And we talk about that with talents and gifts and service and even your words. And so we are going to give you the next few minutes to, in your heart of heart, ask God what he asks of you this week because he gave all of himself for you. So what does it look like for you to give all of yourself to him? Would you join with me as we pray a blessing upon these offerings that we offer to God? Almighty God, you have given us so much. You have poured yourself out for us. You have offered yourself to us, and so we offer ourselves back to you. Heavenly Father, come. Bless that which we offer back to you, and may it be used for the feeding and the filling and the redeeming of your world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Westminster, go from this place in peace, in hope, in love, in life, in faith, and in joy. Go forth knowing that you go in the presence of the Lamb who was slain and in the care of the one seated on the throne. Go forth in the glory and hope and joy of the world that is coming, proclaiming the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, the justice of God. Go forth with the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit now and all the days of your life. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen.